Say hello to my little friend. Hey guys, Omar here. And for the last couple of weeks, I've been testing the Nikon Z or Z F. Now this was a loaner from B&H. Thank you B&H for lending us the camera, but now it's my personal copy. So this is an unbiased ownership <laughs> review of the Nikon ZF and I'm gonna go over what I loved about the camera and what I hope is improved in future generations. Now, if you notice right away, one of the things, one of the major complaints in most of the reviews is the ergonomics, that the camera is heavy, which is great. That means it's built like a tank, <laughs> but it's hard to hold. So here we have the, uh, you know, made for ZF small rig grip on there. And it actually does make a pretty good difference. I wish the grip was just a little deeper. You know, maybe there were like two options for grips would be great. This one's a little shallow, definitely helps. I ain't complaining, but it would be nice if there were one for working, like you're gonna shoot a wedding all day, like a beefier one. Maybe that'll come. Check out this quick aperture demo, guys. Look at that. How cool is that? All right, let's start with nitpicky negatives. Just because I know based on social media, most people like to go negative first. <laughs> so uh, we'll start with uh, lens choices. There aren't too many lens choices that make the camera this tiny. We got this 40 millimeter F2. There's a 28 millimeter that's tiny. There's a 26, which is super small, which looks great. And there's like a zoom lens, the plasticky full frame zoom lens, which would keep the camera small. Um, now that's less of an issue with the grip. As soon as you put a bigger lens on there, come here, bigger lens. The camera is actually with the grip, not too bad to hold. You see, so if you were using it as a working camera, it's not too bad. My palm here, it depends on the size of your hands, but my palm here is taking most of the brunt of the camera. But for the most part, I, I support the lens. I support you lens <laughs> while I'm shooting. So it makes it less of an issue. The grip is an absolute must if you're using your uh, Z or Z lenses or any larger lenses. So the choices of lenses to keep it retro -y and small uh, are a little limited. Second one is this negative. I mean, look at that full frame sensor. Oh my gosh. That's not the negative. The negative is once you live with one of these, this is the Nikon Z8, which has a sensor shield, which when you turn the camera off sort of protects the uh, sensor a little bit. <laughs> once you have one of those, then every time you change your lens, this is what goes through your head as soon as you take off the lens. You can almost feel the dust hitting the surface. And it's a little pricey to sort of, you know, clean your sensor. Although we have a video on how you could do it yourself for cheap. I'll link that up below. I would say the next negative is that there is no easy way to save your user settings. So here's the Nikon Z6 II. It's got a couple of things on the dial here called user settings, U1, U2, and U3. These are fantastic, especially if you're shooting events and you're going from one set of conditions to another, maybe outdoor to indoor with flash, it's great to just switch all your settings. For example, the Z8 is great for that. You actually can save entire settings, like make it a completely different camera, and they're called banks, which work great on the Nikon Z8. But with the Nikon ZF, there's no way to save your settings, so you're constantly working with the camera, like updating white balance or anything like that. One other possible negative, although I haven't been affected by it, is that there's not that many customizable buttons. But I found that the way I'm shooting this camera, I pretty much set it up and it's ready to go. I'm not really changing my settings too much. Remember old film cameras? You weren't really customizing on the fly. You know, you had your film in there and it was just exposure. So I find that's how I'm using and enjoying this camera. The next semi deal breaker is that Automatic ISO on this camera, ISO, is just a little confusing. It takes a little practice. And I made a whole video about it in case you have this camera and you need help. But uh, it's not a deal breaker at all. I found that I got used to it. Sometimes you're using the dial for ISO and other times you have to put it on C for like command mode to get into auto ISO. So just something to think about.
Hello there. Okay, I'm recording this on the Nikon ZF on full auto. Like, who cares? Just put it on A. <laughs> and we're testing the internal mics. And I'm out here doing a little motorcycle, obviously. Obviously. But this is the camera on full auto. Let's see if we backlight ourselves. Hello, full auto. <laughs> see how it adjusts here. And in full auto, you have uh, access to your exposure comp dial. So we can make the image darker and lighter, which is great. And exposure comp dial is awesome for that. I hope it sounds good. Looks good on the screen. I'm going into sun and into shade. And it looks like it's doing a decent job. Let's try some of the other modes. Okay, aperture priority mode now. That last footage, I think, looked probably like a, t a phone <laughs> because it probably picked F11 or something. So now I'm picking F4 so that the background looks nice and the camera's picking a shutter speed. I don't have an ND filter, so it's picking a auto ISO uh, of low, 125, 200, keeps jumping around and the shutter is 125. It does seem to be exposing for my face because this looks really bright back here which is a bonus. I notice sometimes some cameras try to even out all the exposure. Let's try, I have to take this helmet off. I am using the 24 to 70 F4 kit lens and F4 does give you some uh, blurry backgrounds there, but we're just checking how the camera exposes. Here's my face, overexpose, go into the shadow. Here we go, shade exposes a little bit more. Looks like it's doing a decent job there. Uh, wow, look at those leaves falling. Okay, the next uh, thing to be aware of is it's a great video camera. That's not a negative, but <laughs> uh, if you're hybrid shooting, that means you're going from photo to video, um, it, it's probably best not to use it as a retro dial camera. So that means if you're going from photo to video all the time, it's actually better to use it like a normal camera instead of a retro cra camera. <laughs> you know what I mean. With that said, if you're shooting photos on a particular, you know, point on your dial here, like you have a shutter speed set, if you switch to video, all you have to do is flick it to the third stop mode and then the camera will remember your shutter speed that you set here. Next semi-negative is size. The camera is retro and beautiful, but if you're a street photographer, something that's tiny and small and discreet is probably better and easier to walk around and get shots with. The camera is definitely heavy, bulky, not pocketable. It's, uh, I would say it's less street savvy uh, and actually may draw more attention looking all beautiful and filmy like this. Oh yeah. Another thing that I'm not super happy about is the, the microphone plug is at the bottom of the screen. So actually your cord uh, can hide your audio levels if you're recording. Um, as opposed to the Sony, the audio level jack is at the top and so you can see your whole screen. So that's something I hope changes in the future. Another thing I wish was a little better was a, a more robust back button. This guy's they're so small and tiny. Just make it a nice fat button for us back button shooters would be great. All right, I talked about all the stuff I didn't like. Let's talk about the stuff I do like. First of all, startup is really fast. Check it out. Boop, ready to go. Oh yeah. Second, I like the way I've been shooting this camera, which is I actually take the screen, turn it around and close it. And because older photographers out there, I see you. Since I use readers, <laughs> I, with the Ricoh GR, I actually have to use readers to see the screen, which is so embarrassing. Um, but this camera, I just shut the screen. It protects the screen and I do everything in the viewfinder. One other thing I've been loving about the camera is the image quality. It's got the beautiful rich colors. It's got great skin tones, just straight out of camera. After looking and comparing at the three, the Nikon ZF seems to line up more with the newer Z8 as far as auto white balance goes, as far as colors go. If you shoot, that's straight out of camera JPEGs, by the way. It, it seems like the image quality straight out of camera JPEGs is a little better than the Z6 II, dare I say. However, if you shoot raw on all three, you can match all three easily by setting your white balance to custom or picking a white balance with a color picker, and then the colors are all identical. But as far as like the camera processor and the 
color yada yada. It's doing a great job where I would actually consider this my new backup to the Nikon Z8 over the Nikon Z6 II um, because of that, where they can match them a little better. Next, I thought it was a gimmick, but I love it. The black and white switch has been probably the most fun thing about this camera. Just changing your world to black and white film, just like that. And the straight up regular monotone, monotone? Monochrome, I'm monotone right now. <laughs> monochrome on the Nikon. I, I made a video about this before, the Nikon Noir, that the, it's probably the, the best kept secret is the black and white tones and contrast from the Nikon just gives you beautiful black and white straight out of camera. And then they added a new picture style called Rich Tone, which I've been making my default, but it is great for video. I actually used it for my most recent video that I did, and uh, I like the look of it. Autofocus is fantastic. It has the same processor as the Z8, the same modes as the Z8, and I did a bunch of, um, you know, I did a test, little track test with my daughter, uh, you know, running at me, and shooting burst at 10 frames a second, I think. I did 12 frames a second, but I think it only missed one or two shots compared to the Z6 II, which missed, first of all, in the tracking mode, missed a bunch. So the, the, the tracking, I don't know what they call it. It's gonna be phased out, but <laughs> that tracking mode that they have with the little box, that didn't work so great. But using my um, large box with eye autofocus did a lot better on the Z6 II. Funny story too, I shot some cross country track using burst and I, the camera stopped working for a second. I'm like, what's going on? And it turns out I had forgotten my SD card and the little micro SD card had, uh, you know, I've reached the buffer. The poor little micro SD card was struggling, but did an amazing job. I got tons of great track photos, which brings me autofocus, fantastic. The next one is the little micro SD card is so great to just stick in there and forget. A camera with internal storage is something I've wanted for a long time in case you forget you know, your SD card. But this is a great solution, is if you're not gonna give us two card slots, give us a little micro SD card that we can stick in there and forget. It could just back up a bunch of JPEGs if you're gonna use this for an event. It could actually back up RAWs too. And it works seamless seamlessly. It's also super low light autofocus is great. The camera almost sees in the dark. I lowered all the lights in here and made it look kind of, I'll show you a clip of how dark the room was. And I put my dummy back there and it could find an eye. It's a little slower, of course. It's sort of probably better if you put it in single focus mode and it works to grab focus, but it can find things in the dark, which was fantastic. All right, an exciting noise test. <laughs> this totally depends on your noise tolerance. I will show you the noise. Uh, I'll, you know, zoom in. Thank you, Miles, for helping us out today. <laughs> I'll zoom in and then zoom out because if you're pixel peeping, you will find noise, okay? If this is, look, we'll find some noise in here. See that right there? <laughs> Actually, it's pretty clean. So this is ISO 100. This is 400, I just skipped 200 because it's so clean. 800 on the ZF, 1600, 1600 on the ZF, 3200, 3200. And in a second, I'll be comparing them, by the way. Oh, sorry, didn't really take a look at 3200. 3200, a little noise. 6400, 6400, we start to see more noise now. I would say this is probably uh, my ceiling where I could, you know, you still have a lot of detail and you can work with the image and clean it up. Uh, 12,800 is still usable for me. I mean, again, it depends on your tolerance. You could clean this up too with AI easily. And again, we're zooming. So if you have the picture, like it's better to get the shot <laughs> with noise than, you know, get a blurry image because of slow shutters. So that's 12,800, still pretty good. 25,600, this is zoomed in, 25,600, but zoomed out. Remember, zoomed out and we can AI it, 25,600. And then super high, 51,200, not zoomed. You can already see the noise. I mean, look at this, woo, baby. But at least you have that in case you have to get, you know, Sasquatch. 
All right, the ZF and the Z62 are pretty much identical as far as noise goes. This is 3200, pretty similar there, 3200 noise wise. And this is 12,800, 12,800. Now comparing the Nikon ZF to the Z8, I found that the ZF is about one stop better at noise performance than the Z8. This is 1600, still clean. 3200, uh, the Z8, just a little bit more noise, just a tad more noise, but no big deal. 3200 to me is my Z8 ceiling because I feel at 6400, the Z8 now starts to introduce too much noise. And again, we're zooming. Once you zoom, you introduce, you know, you start to see the noise a lot more. So if we're pretty much there, you can kind of see how much cleaner the ZF is. And this is what the Z62 is like as well. And 12,800 uh, to me is usable on the ZF. And then the Z8 to me is just kind of like, why? Now, just for fun, let's compare with the uh, Fujifilm X-Pro2, which also has 24 megapixels. This is at ISO 800 on the 2. So you can see the Nikon ZF is just slightly cleaner. Again, we're zooming here. So at 800, not an issue. 1600 ZF on the left, X-Pro2 on the right. That's what they look like zoomed in. 3200, not zoomed in. But uh, here you start to lose detail a little bit too much on the Fujifilm. Uh, and the ZF is still doing nice, clean, clean. Here's the color checker passport, so you can see. All right, 6400, not zoomed in. Again, not an issue. And you can clean this up if you want to. Uh, but this is what it looks like zoomed in. 6400 on the Fujifilm right. And the ZF is still a cleaner. And 12,800 uh, to me isn't really usable. I mean, it's usable on the Fujifilm, but I don't want to use it. Eight stops of stabilization. Great for video. It does wobble with a super wide, so be careful. I did see some wobbles in the corners with a super wide, uh, but really great handheld video with this, uh, with this camera. And also really slow shutter speeds and low light. I recently went to a little museum with uh, my dad and my daughter, and here's some of that. museum a lot of low light here today we're using the nikon zf as almost like a little travel test if you're in a museum if you're traveling if you're looking at exhibits and uh the best part of this camera is that little black and white switch like when you're just inspired to kind of see something in black and white first i thought it was very gimmicky and now i just love switching to the black and white um you know ooh, bad lighting there stick to the good lighting Hello. The last little note I put on there is be careful of this being an emotional purchase. This is a beautiful camera that maybe you just want and don't need. If you're selling some old gear to sort of upgrade, then yes, but uh, you may not need this camera, uh, but damn, you sure want it, don't you? <laughs> so is the Nikon ZF for you? I don't know. It is for me though. <laughs> All right, hope that was helpful. I'll see you guys next time.